Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 260 for Monday, June 15th, 2020. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab. Welcome back to Gig Gab. If it's not your first time, welcome to the family if it is. We're the show for by and about working musicians. And here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in San Jose, California, Paul Kent. So we have, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about leaving Durham, New Hampshire, maybe for a gig, maybe in several weeks or a month or something. But I, I want to talk about that. Because there's, you know, there's this whole concept of re-entry anxiety that that I'm certainly experiencing. Uh, so we'll have that conversation a, a little bit uh, later in the show. We uh, we have a question from Michael about uh, audio interfaces that we'll address uh, before that. Do we have anything else to talk about today, Mr. Kent? Um, no, I, I want to talk about I want to talk about the concept of what what a gig might look like today. I think yeah. that's a fascinating thing. I had a, I had a great phone call with a local musician, actually a text message chat with a local yeah. musician. Nice. And uh, I think it's really informative and something, you know, just to think about. Yeah. Certainly going to be, it's going to inflame some people and it's going to warm other people's hearts. Sure. Like many things. Yeah. We, we, we aren't intending to inflame or, well, our, our, I was going to say, or warm. No, quite frankly, we, our intent is to warm and, and inform and, and all of that. But some of this is a little bit of therapy for us, especially it's for part those, of the deal. Absolutely. For those of us experiencing reentry anxiety, which is me, <laughs> yeah. um, as I, as it turns out, you know, uh, so, uh, but first, and I don't mean to be dismissive of, Reentry anxiety or any kind of anxiety. I'm just sort of accepting it as a thing. Um, but the first thing I want to do is talk about gear because I love talking about gear. And evidently, so do all of you. We've been getting lots of questions, including this one from Michael, who says, uh, I've, uh, his, he's got a client as well, uh, who says, um, uh, he's a musician and a music teacher and is looking for an all in one audio interface with at least eight channels and XLR possible on all of them. Uh, he says, uh, now that you've converted a lot of your equipment from uh, Firewire and or USB to Thunderbolt, do you have any insight here? The needs are primarily for broadcast on Zoom, uh, but needs multiple channels and all of that. Looking for a, so an affordable solution with good preamps. Okay, so you're already way ahead of where most people would be, in my opinion here, because you know what you need in terms of you know, you need more than two XLRs. So you're looking at that, you know, four to eight XLR range. And maybe he needs more than four because he said, I need, you know, eight channels and XLR possible on all of them. Okay. Uh, thankfully, there are lots of things like this. And you know that you need good preamps, which is key. It, it like, it's easy to dismiss the quality of the preamps when you're looking at this stuff, because there are so many other factors. Are you going to get USB? Are you going to get Thunderbolt? You know, what, what's the cost? And then it's like, okay, well, I got eight, eight XLRs. I'm good to go. Well, let me tell you as someone who has been, I don't want to say completely dismissive, but mildly dismissive of preamps in the past. I've had some learnings recently in terms of all the stuff that I've been testing out. So there's really two things that I would recommend here. If you want to go the Thunderbolt route, the there are others on the Thunderbolt scale, but it, it in terms of things that cost less than a thousand dollars, and I think this one is about six six hundred, maybe maybe six fifty, is the Personas Quantum twenty six twenty six. It is the least expensive eight channel Thunderbolt interface on the market, and it is fantastic. You are hearing this show through one right now. I've been using it for the podcast for the last three or four weeks. I've been using it to do some drum tracking and things like that. And as I mentioned last week, it's also sort of the master brain linking via ADAT to two other units that are giving me more channels. They call it the 2626 because even though it's only got eight ins and outs on it via ADAT and, and SPDIF, if you want to go that route, you can get up to 26 channels. I've added 16 to it via two ADAT connections. So now I'm at 24. I didn't use SPDIF, so I'm only at, you know, for me, it's a quantum 24, 24, but I do have this option of going up to 26, 26. Um, and it works really well. The, 
you know, I've prior to this, I was using a Focusrite interface and, and that's actually the other one that I'll, that I'll talk about here is a USB interface, but the, and, and I got very spoiled focus rights management software of the interface of their interfaces allows for super amounts of flexibility. Like I can, ch I can go in and tell the interface how to route everything around personas software. Doesn't quite do that. Like the headphones are always mapped to main one and two or outputs one and two the main there. And there are two headphone things on this. The mains are mapped to the same output one and two. So you've got main and two headphones, but they are all going to pull from the one and two, uh, what, you know, channels one and two, even though you can send 26 channels to this thing, the only thing the headphones and the mains are ever going to hear is one and two. So you just kind of take that under advisement and you realize, okay, well, I didn't go and spend, you know, two grand on an interface. I spent 600 bucks. And so that's great. The, the focus right stuff I can route, you know, I, I can say, well, I want eight, eight, you know, nine and 10 to go to the headphones. And then that way I can use the eight outputs on the, on the back for anything else. No problem. It, you know, it happily will do all that. So that's the, that's the main difference in terms of management of the interfaces. Uh, headroom though, this personas one is amazing. Uh, Paul, I, I use a dynamic mic when I podcast, I use a Heil PR 40 great mic. It's a great sounding mic. Doesn't pick up much of the room. All of that great stuff works well for my voice, et cetera, et cetera. The one issue is because it's a large diaphragm dynamic mic, it requires a huge amount of gain on the interface. Most mm -hmm. interfaces that I plug this into either don't have enough and I need something like a, a FET head or a cloud lifter to put in line and add more gain before it hits the interface or I have it cranked to, you know, like between five and six o'clock on the, you know, on the gain knob, right? Almost all the way. Almost all the way. And most interfaces, that's where they start to distort a little bit when you're, you know, pulling in that much gain. Is that's, that a function of the preamp? It is. It's 100% the preamp. It's how much headroom does that preamp have? How much gain can it provide? That's exactly it. On this Personas interface right now while I'm talking to you, and I'm actually realizing my gain's a little higher than I normally would want it, um, I am at maybe 130 on the knob. Uh, mm -hmm. So I could go way more, and, and I would be overdriving, and that, like, you know, I don't want to, so that's why I don't have it there. But it, <laughs> it's, it's super clean. It's, you know, very, very, like, these preamps are awesome. Uh, and because it's Thunderbolt, I've actually had to get used to hearing myself on less of a delay uh, right. because I've been using, you know, USB or and or Firewire for years and always had some, you know, amount of very mildly noticeable latency between when I talk and when I hear myself in my ears. Very mildly noticeable. I had to get I mean, used little, to it. There's a, there's a little bit, but you but you know it. I know. Yeah. And when I bring people into the studio, you know, I have to tell them you're going to, you're going to notice a delay. I I'm used to it now. I don't even hear it anymore. Yeah. It, you know, and so much so that when I switched to this interface the first week, it was like, Oh no, 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 no. This isn't going to work. So I went into logic and actually added more buffers in and have slowly oh, been weird. weaning myself off of them. Yeah. 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 Um, but it's a great so, interface. So, so, but I want to talk about the, the new Scarlet one that I've just tested out, which is the, the USB interface I would recommend, but that's the, that's the Thunderbolt one, but you have, so a before you get there, let me yeah. just kind of offer this. Um, you know, I've been thinking about buying this zoom L eight mixer, like everything's changing, right? You know, the things are moving ahead. Audio interfaces used to be crazy expensive and, um, they're, they're kind of almost functional check list things on many items now. So I was using, my Bose TS1 that came with my Bose tower system, I happened to notice it had a USB port on it. And lo and behold, it can serve as an interface. This Zoom L8 is kind of interesting. I don't know if all eight channels, so it's $399. Okay, yep. I don't know if all eight channels have XLR. I Probably not. Usually when it's an eight channel board, the last one or two are only quarter yeah. inch, right? Yeah, that's but, awesome. um Often, right? So maybe it won't fit, but um, $399, you get a mixer, you get effects. You, it's USB and it is an audio interface and it actually will record to SD at the same time. So sure. I think the Thunderbolt thing is less important if the purpose of this interface is streaming, right? Because mm -hmm. once it goes out, you don't well, really care. It depends on whether you want to do real-time monitoring of the tracks that you are recording. So no, that... 
What, th- that you were recording. Okay, I agree with that. Yeah, it, 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 you know, especially if you're hooking it up to your DAW or or whatever. Like that's where your latency really begins to matter. Is is in 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 that scenario. Now now some interfaces will allow you to do what they call you know zero latency monitoring or or no latency monitoring, where you hear from inside the interface. Like you're not getting I, it with effects or anything, but you are able to say, yeah, route that directly to my headphones without, and then also send it, you know, back over the USB interface to my DAW or whatever. I, but, but that's where, that's where Thunderbolt helps. Thunderbolt also gives you lots more bandwidth. I don't know that it would be possible to do a USB eight interface. Channels, yeah. Well, eight channels is fine. That that'll work over USB. 16 channels will work over USB. I don't know that I've ever seen a USB interface that'll do 26 like this one will. Got it. Right. So, so that's also, I think, I think in, in, in days gone by, you used firewire when you wanted that, that level of, of bandwidth, you know, to, to be able to pump, sure. you know, 64 channels into your, into your DAW or whatever in a, in a pro studio, you wouldn't be able to use USB without aggregating devices and kind of mess getting messy, you know? So, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Um, the the focus right though I, for years i used a focus right scarlet 18i20 which is their uh eight channel you know one u rack mount interface very look in, essentially very similar in looks and and layout to this quantum one uh, from personas that one can only do as we just said one ADAT out to an expansion unit because it's usb and so that's where the 18i20 comes from the I-20 means they've added an extra two channels on the output to sort of assign as you will. And that's one of the, you know, sort of leveraging the benefit of as what I said with Focusrite, where they really know how to, uh, you know, they, they, they give you that software that just lets you map things any way you want. And it can be very handy. And, you know, like I've got a headphone mix out over by my drums with my old, they've got the, the new Scarlet 18 I-20, uh, add some features. I've got a very old one. I've, well, I've actually got both here now to test the third gen one, but I've got a second gen one that I'm using essentially as a, an audio extension over by my drums, but it's great because I can assign the headphones over there. So I don't have to have a headphone cable running across to the computer. It just plug in right next to the drums and it's good. Right. Um, the one thing or one of the things that they added to this gen three Scarlet is what they call air. Uh, it's a, um, it, it comes from their, their, oh, what's the name of the, the Claret uh, interface, which is their much higher end interfaces. Mm-hmm. And what Air does is it adds um, presence to instruments, basically built for like acoustic guitars and especially for vocals uh, to really give it that extra presence. And I'll tell you, it, it makes those preamps really sing. Uh, I've been, I've been super impressed with, with just how musical they sound. Uh, cool. yeah, for, you know, for solid state preamps, they, I mean, I, they are solid state preamps and they sound very good. I don't mean to be dismissive of solid state preamps. They're extremely clean, but that air thing gives them a musicality that, that I've never really heard in a, in a solid state or any kind of preamp like this before, especially at that price point. So I, you know, for your buddy, uh, for Michael's question here. I would probably lean towards the the Scarlet. I mean, if you want Thunderbolt, there's no question. The Quantum is, you know, from Personas, the 2626. That's what you want. Like, no ifs, ands, or buts. Just go get it. You know, unless you want to go spend two grand or more, and then and then you've got some other options. But, uh, but I, you know, for most folks out there that want some flexibility and routing and all that stuff. If you're not looking to build an, a studio that needs to expand beyond your eight channels, uh, the, you know, and, and if Thunderbolt, like you said, Paul, if Thunderbolt's not the most important thing in terms of that latency, you getting the flexibility of what you get with like a Scarlet over USB might be a better choice. Like, like I said, you're not really going to go wrong with either. It's more, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're at 90% with either one of them. And now it's like, okay, well, which way are you leaning? And, and yeah. then pick one is, is, you know, you're, you're going to be super happy with either one. That would be my opinion. So, yep. yeah. Cool. All right. So as I mentioned, I've, I've, 
I, I've realized in the last week that I'm suffering what's being, what's now being called reentry anxiety, where it's like, you know, in our, in our County, we have had one new reported case of COVID-19 in the last 10 days. Now, you know, a, a lot of that is because we've been doing a great job with social distancing and all of that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's over here. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure it doesn't mean that it's over here. But so you're in a college town. I am. Yeah. So the likeliness that it's over, over, I mean, maybe summertime, your town goes down by population by two thirds. E our, my out. town does, but my county is much bigger than just my town. Uh, okay. And, and, and really in New Hampshire, the counties that are having major problems with cases are the ones sort of south of us along the Massachusetts border and then Manchester, which is also sort of over there, but is a little further north than the border. So like there, there are still issues here in, in New Hampshire on a daily basis, but you know, over where we are here on the seacoast and stuff. So quite surprisingly to me, we've really got this under control also and related today, our stay at home order expired and it was replaced by the governor with a safer at home order. But essentially what it means is, yeah, look, you know, this thing hasn't gone away. You uh, still are at risk if you are interacting with humans. So uh, you need to still, you know, be very cognizant of that. You should wear a mask if you are in with gatherings. Uh, but the 10 person gathering restriction that was in place up until midnight is no longer in place. And it also means that, that, uh, restaurants as of today can open for indoor dining. We've been open for outdoor dining for uh, about three weeks. And depending on where you are, you can, it, your allowed capacity is somewhere between 50% of what you would normally be able to have. And in some places, especially in the Northern parts of the state where it's far less populated, a hundred percent. So a lot of things are getting back to closer to what we knew as normal. No, nothing's there yet, but the closer we get to normal, uh, you know, the the more this idea of interacting with other humans, and for me that means musicians, uh, starts to become a thing that's sort of popping up on the radar. And I had to start, I realized that I was, you know, very concerned about all of, uh, you know, all of the risks that are there. And at some point those concerns would actually be greater than the risks. And I don't, I don't think I am at, the, I don't think that that's true now, but I realized that I was sort of heading down a path of like, I'm going to be scared of this thing far longer than the data that I would care about would tell me to be scared. So I've, I've started looking more, not obsessively, but more intentionally at the data, you know, kind of like I was at the beginning of this, like, do we really need to shut down and all that? And it's like, ah, yes, we do. And then I sort of stopped looking at the data because it was like, well, we're shut down. I know what to do now. You know, I'm not making any changes. We're just kind of cruising along. And so, uh, but now, you, you know, like the idea, I, if I had a gig tonight, I don't know how I'd feel about it, Paul, but mm. the idea of playing an outdoor gig in the appropriate venue where, you know, precautions and all of that were, were safe and with the right band. And I have some comments to make about that. Uh, and meaning the musicians whom I trust and, and, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like they've been doing enough and they feel like I've been doing enough and you know, all of that. Uh, I like, you know, I could, I could foresee that happening relatively soon next couple of weeks ish. So that's, that's been an interesting thought process for me. Well, you know, nobody wants to be first or some actually, <laughs> some, some, people knows, do. Knows, some people want to be first. And um, those have already happened. Like those gigs have been happening for the last couple of weeks, ever since restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let me, let me give you another perspective on it. Sure. So here in Silicon Valley, San Jose, you know, the San Francisco Bay area, Yeah. it, you know, it was one of the first hotspots. Right. Um, we got shut down fairly soon. Seems like we did a good job, um, of, of, uh, of flattening the curve. Um, California is a big place and California in general seems to be going the other direction right now, but I can't tell you where in California, but what I can tell you is almost from the beginning, 
there were the murmurs of, I thought this was America, you know, the government can't tell us to stay in our house. Of course. Like a lot of, a lot of um, personal liberty arguments. Let's just, you know, yeah. try and be judicious with how we talk about this. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's, that's true. They're the people that, that, that decided that this was not, uh, this, th this was not the right response for us to take. Right. Right. Uh, similar, you know, people who have that response typically had the same response about mask requirements or ma there's no requirements, but mask requests. Yeah. In some like, places there are requirements, but not here, nor it sounds like there. So yeah. I don't even know, but even in the places where there are requirements, I don't know how they're, in, they're enforced or how stringently they're enforced. It Fair. sounds like, you know, right. New York yep. had requirements, but I don't have never heard of anybody getting arrested for not wearing a mask. Right. Um, anyway, I got a really interesting call from another musician in the area. He's been a musician in this area for a long time, longer than I Yep. Um, has in for pieces of time. Music was his, was his livelihood. And, um, you know, he's, I would say he's, you know, a, a, a solid part of the South Bay area music community. And he was saying, I just read about this local club and I, I had read the story as well. So I wasn't surprised by the call. And he said, you know, They've put out a note saying, and, and it was a club that his band had a regular gig with, three-piece band. Um, the note said, hey, um, we're using the time of, of shelter in place to remodel the club. We'd love to get some bands in here to uh, test our acoustics and give us feedback. Hmm. All right, right? I mean, on the surface, like if every club made that, had that thought process while they were redesigning, that would be a good thing it, in a general sense. I, I'm not necessarily saying their implementation of it is good. I'm just saying I wish clubs, all clubs would think about acoustics and, and this pandemic time is actually a good that's time. That's the nerd on you though. But that's the nerd. Well, but this pandemic time <laughs> is a good time to sort of rethink this stuff. Cause you can't be open, right? You can't be doing these things. So this, so I, here's I, the deal. I like the, 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 the idea is as a premise, yes. right? <laughs> I get it. The premise proves false almost immediately. Like, sure, that's why I jumped in. The club is down to plywood. Yeah, <laughs> the club is down to plywood. There's no, you know, acoustic reinforcement happening there. It's, it's, okay. it's literally ripped down to plywood, right? Yeah. And simultaneously, there are these messages coming out. Hey, um, come to our club. You can sit outside on the patio, or you can go down on the street. And, uh, and, you know, you can have a cocktail from us. Oh, and by the way, there'll be some live music. You can't go inside with them, right? So anyway, this was, and again, a, a club that wants to try and figure out some way to get some revenue if they didn't get federal assistance money, you know, I get it. You know, people are scratching to, to fall in line. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to fault the club as much, but here's the deal. Uh, the gig is unpaid, right? Um, and there's a line of bands that were happy to to take the gig for the sake of playing. And that's what this phone call from this other musician was about. Like, can you believe this? I mean, this thing isn't over yet. Musicians, you know, are doing it. They're doing it unpaid. They're doing it under a false premise that, um, you know, it's just to test the acoustics. And, and I'm sure they know that it's not really, you know, about testing the acoustics once, once they agree to do it. But um, I was thinking... And in the conversation I had with Ray, my friend, it was musicians are just so often their worst enemy. The desire to play, and this is where the the hobbyist versus the semi-professional versus the professional in any lo locality really gets complicated, right? I mean, musicians really haven't had a raise since the early seventies, right? Your scale well, we've had a, two or three hour gig. Yeah, it has it has dropped. I mean, the the dropped. price has been fixed. Well, inflation has moved past us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 and to the degree that, um, like when this started, I had a bunch of friends who did, a, and I actually did one as well, um, benefits for the venues that play, hoping to, you know. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, I like that. And it's one of the things that makes musicians different than business people is that they are not guided by the same the same North star, you know, to make yeah. decisions, you kind of like, what do you think is the right thing to do in this situation? But literally, you know, that club, if they had a bad couple months, they would cut you. Right. I mean, of I know course that they right? would, right. They would, or they would ask to cut your pay or, you know, and it's already, you know, moderate pay as it is. And so I was thinking that, you know, this is another example that, you know, musicians exist on a, on a plane where we, we would like fair compensation for what we do because there's value in what we do. 
But if we can't do the thing that is inside of us to do, it causes all sorts of moral dilemmas. And, you know, this is probably the ultimate example of that, right? Literally, you can rationalize your, your mind to a place of endangering yourself, your bandmates, and your customers, your, you know, your fans. Yeah. Because you miss playing so much. So you talk about re-entry anxiety. You know, I was thinking, I will admit, I'm sitting here going, oh, man, 20 years of hard work marketing my brand, marketing my band, building, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to take that. And I'm watching these other bands, you know, do things that I'm, I'm really struggling to keep my mind in the place like, you know what, they're making the choice that's best for them. And I'm making the choice that's best for me. And it's not sitting with me great, but, um, but I get it. You know, I understand that, you know, that it's a, a series of rationalizations that are, that makes sense to the person making them, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what it, and, and that's sort of where I've fallen on this is I know that I am just as, as subject to those rationalizations as anybody else. I mean, it, there's a very, you know, not, we're not all exactly the same, but I know that, that, you know, like anyone, I, I can rationalize myself into a scenario that might be good or might be bad for me. And so I've been trying to do a lot of these, you know, sort of self checks on, all right, am I making a stupid decision here? And that's why I kind of, for myself had to like, start looking at the data again, you know, once, once a day, like, where are we here? Okay. What are the trends? Yes. Okay. You know, what, what, where, where would it have to be two weeks from today? Cause I've, I've, I think I said this on this show, I don't know, uh, where, you know, I keep telling myself every two weeks, like, uh, wait two more weeks. Let's see where it goes. Cause we really have in, in, in New Hampshire and in, in this part of New England anyway, really been heading towards a, you know, the, the, the case, the new cases are, are very limited. They're, you know, compartmentalized, all of that stuff. And, and so, but I keep saying two weeks, uh, this one, I actually mean it. And I, I needed to tell myself what mean it meant. And that was looking at the numbers and, and saying, okay, if, if these, if this path remains, then yes, it, right now, I think I'd be comfortable going out if it had been this way for two weeks. The other thing that I get right now, and my, my friend Billy has a nice word for him uh, that I'll share, but uh, is that we have a lot of people that are sort of finished. You know, they've hit their frustration level or they feel comfortable for whatever reason reengaging at a much greater scale than than has been in the last couple of weeks. Right. Because the state has issued guidance that says, you know, we can do all of these new things. And every week today is restaurants can open and several other things. Next week is uh, I think day camps can open and several other things a week from then overnight camps can open and several other things. You know, it's like there's this thing. And of course the government, uh, you know, this, the governor's office has made it very clear. Look, you know, we reserve the right to pump the brakes on this and we will pump the brakes on this if we see things turn around, you know, and, and start going in a bad direction. Okay, great. Fine. The difference, you know, is all these people are now going out. And, and so I would never ask anyone to risk their lives, uh, on my behalf to gather data mm -hmm. for me, but I am very appreciative of people that are choosing on their own without my desires involved to risk their lives in my opinion and gather data for me. And, you know, my friend Billy happily re referred to them on our bitter pill live stream on Saturday as canaries. So, uh, I, I do appreciate this, you know, and that will be, if we go two more weeks with all of these people doing all of these new things. And yes, technically it started today, but based on what I saw this past weekend is when most people started this, uh, it was a nice weekend. It's summer, you know, graduation for high school, yeah. all, you know, like, of course, like people are going to jump the gun a little bit, you know, and that's, that, that, that's fine. You know, um, Mondays are arbitrary days anyway. So the fact that people started this on Saturday, fine, whatever, you know, uh, we're going to know a lot two weeks from today uh, about, I guess about we are. This. I mean, here's the deal. We have, we, we are learning different things than we thought we would learn from Memorial day weekend. We are learning. We don't know what we're learning from the protests, right? You know, there's, you know, the age demographics that this will affect and all this type of stuff. I don't, 
it is mind boggling to me. 120,000 people dead in basically 100 days, 120 days, right? Yep. A lot of people. It is a short amount of time, right? It was to me, it was a ridiculously short amount of time to even start talking about reopening. And the concept of reopening to me, it is literally telling everybody, here's your leveraged risk. And yes. the problem, especially for musicians, to me, like you said, you're going to choose the musicians that you feel you have the weighted average of knowing yes. that they're <laughs> that they're honest about what they've been doing or, you know, conscientious about what they've been doing. Yeah. But you know, the problem is, is that you play live music, you you gather people. Those people might go visit grandma in the old folks' home. They might go right. drive across the state and visit other family or friends. And does this thing I believe we are rationalizing. We have meaningful data in the first hundred days to make this life and death decisions. To me, it just doesn't seem like that's, that's right. And it ties quite a bit to the, this is America. I can, my personal liberties, nobody's telling me to stay in my house. Nobody's going to tell me to wear a mask. There it feels to me like it's a ton of deaths. N like nothing. I think we've seen in our lifetime, Dave, right? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. In a I very mean, probably, short amount of time. Yeah. yeah. In a very short amount of time to think we are able to meaningfully extract the data. I think that's a stretch. Well, so mm. here, here's, and I'm, I don't fault you for your logic here. Like your logic mm -hmm. is quite sound. In fact, um, the way I look at it is, you know, I am not an infectious disease expert. I also know that the infectious disease experts have maybe have studied, I hopefully <laughs> have studied this, but they haven't been through it. Not in mm. this way. Right. So right. we're all going to get some part of this wrong. Like we have right. to give ourselves, we have to acknowledge that, but we also have to give ourselves permission to have gotten something wrong because if we don't give ourselves and each other permission to get things wrong, then that's where we start becoming entrenched. Right. And that's never helpful. That and and quite frankly, that's sort of anti-science, right? I mean, just by definition, I don't mean that to, in, as an attack. I just mean science means you look at the data, you might form a hypothesis, right? And then you look at the data and then you form a conclusion based on the data having nothing to do with your hypothesis. And then you compare and it turns out that your hypothesis was right or wrong. And, and then you move on, right? You know, but you, you go by the data, that's science. So uh, the way I've been looking at this is, I have to apply some trust somewhere or at least intentionally choose not to trust anyone but myself. But as it turns out, I don't think I'm the best person to trust here. A lot of times I am. I mean, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Most of my decisions, I ignore what everybody's telling me and I just trust myself. Right. And most of the time that's the right thing to do, but not all of the time. And here you know, we pay the CDC here in this country, but about seven billion a year. Uh, I feel like I I am not going to go wrong in in at least paying close attention to their guidance for me, right? And the same is true of our state's experts and our doctors and everything. I get that there are you know political influences left and right here. It's a mess. It, it, you know, it part of the, that, quite frankly, that's a huge part of why this is so difficult for me is it's like, I just want the fricking data and I want your, you know, expert analysis of the data and I want all the rest of it out the window. Right. And, yeah. and that, and so Johns Hopkins is also doing quite a bit of good work, uh, in this regard. And I, again, I know that they're not completely immune to this, but you know, they are the ones that for the last 20 years have been, you know, pushing the whole thing of, you know, that, that the LSD is the right thing for a lot of people on uh, that suffer from anxiety and depression. And that's never been a popular viewpoint of the government. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, so I know that they're willing to buck the trend pretty hard. And and so looking at kind of and but no one source. And thankfully, I'm I, I'm living in a time where we are in a spoil of riches in terms of the number of sources we can get things from. That's a benefit and a curse, by the way. And so, you know, CDC, Johns Hopkins, and then how that's being filtered down. And, and at some level, yeah, I've got to trust my state government that they don't want to kill anyone. They also don't want people's businesses to, to die. And I get that every person in a leadership position has to 
uh, it is in a scenario where at least on the surface, they've got to sort of pick that balance. Right. Uh, but uh, so, so that's kind of where I'm coming in, but, but I'm filtering all of that information from any of those essentially three sources yeah. Uh, with does. OK, now you've explained your logic to me. I, I'm not I'm not trained to go through all that, but you've gone through it and you've you've contextualized it. Does your contextualization make sense or does it smell fishy? You know, and does your contextualization match that person's and or that organization's and that organization's? And if everybody. All right, so work with me on this, though, because yeah. I, 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 I your your reasoning works incredibly well. However, here's here's where it sticks for me. Sure. Clearly, there is some, um, I think clearly, some subjective amount of push that happens where the economic argument had strange weight in all this, right? That's what's actually pivoting all this. Like we're all talking about, yeah. you know, well, some people are going to have to die because otherwise the economy goes. But that's literally what we're talking about here, right? How many businesses is it worth and, and what's the relative risk for all that type of stuff? And I think that the data that comes out and here's a problem that I have with the data. Again, you know, Memorial Day was three weeks ago. Yeah. Right. So the data might be different because before Memorial Day, people were doing a decent job. But here's the problem I have with since Memorial Day, your ability to make your decision. And again, who knows how long the trailing indicators are of figuring out what all this means. But your ability to make that decision how do you factor in the quantity of people in this country who are saying, nope, not for me? And if they were saying, you're not going to tell me to stay in my house, my personal liberties are more important. If they were saying that before, and now that things have been released more, that those people's behavior have to be factored in in some strange well, that, way. That's, that's, and then it, on top of that, it doesn't need to be factored so, in. I mean, it or or it's baked in automatically because I'm looking again, three organizations that I picked CDC, Johns Hopkins, my state government. Great. Um, and I feel pretty good about those. But obviously, if anybody feels differently, you know, and thinks I'm making a mistake then doesn't want their, you know, one of their favorite podcasters to, to yeah. you know, suffer harm. Let me know. I am keeping an open mind here, but I had to narrow it down. Right. So I'm looking at that and and then I'm looking at the numbers. And when I see that. You know, in the state of New Hampshire, things are dropping pr new cases per day are dropping precipitously. When I see that in my county specifically, we've literally had one new case reported in 10 days like these these numbers. It, I'm surprised at them simply because of things like Memorial Day. Right. Like mm -hmm. like, quite frankly, I expected it to go in a different direction. And because it didn't, that's when I sort of had to be like, OK, Dave, you can't just rely on what you feel you've got yeah. to do the same thing you're expecting of the scientists. You have to just look at the data. And so I am looking at the data and it's like, if it now, I mean, to be clear, the data would say that I would be perfectly safe picking the right band and the right venue playing a gig tonight. I am not playing a gig tonight. <laughs> right. You, you know, and I'm okay. Like I'm not in a huge rush to do this. I'm really fortunate that I can, still do this, what we're doing here. I can do m most of my business. Uh, I, I enjoy being with my family. None of us are, you know, at, at risk from harm of anybody else in the house. I mean, like there are so many things that I'm fortunate for that I, I couldn't even begin to list them all because I'm taking so many of them for granted, even though I'm trying not yeah. to. Right. Y you know, so I'm good. I, I can record like, I mean, it's crazy what I've got here. So uh, you know, I'm not in a rush, but at the same time, I do know that like I would, uh, m for my emotional health, I would enjoy playing a gig. Uh, and I also appreciate that there are other people for whom that's like, you know, where they make their money too. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's, it's like, okay, so it is adding yet another luxury, although I don't really want to call anyone's emotional health a luxury. I, I think it is very important. And especially now that, you know, we have to sort of factor that in as well. So where, where you are absolutely right, lots of people are factoring in the economics of this. For me, it's, you know, well, the emotional health of this, because this whole anxiety that I've been feeling is not good. It's new for me. It's very mild compared to what I believe other people that, you know, suffer lifelong anxiety have ever felt. So I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I, it, but it, it won't get better unless I help it get better. And there are many ways to do that. 
And if it turns out in two weeks, I can't go start playing gigs because I'm not comfortable with it. Fine. Like, you know, I can talk to a therapist. I can like, do many other things to, to begin to mitigate all this, but it, it just needed to be a conscious effort. Like I need to do a thing and, and you know, the stuff that I know that's good for me involves me interacting with other humans. Um, so so, so, so to answer your question, yeah, all these people, like, like I said, they're the canaries and for the next two weeks, they're out there, you know, flying down into the coal mine and mm. we're going to see what happens when they come out, if they come out. Yeah. yeah. So, so yes, that's how you factor it in. That's sorry. I don't mean to impose anything on anybody. No, no, I that's get how it. I, factor I get it. it in. Yeah. I get it. My, my, um, question of the data is that the sample size is too small, but it will be um, much bigger in two weeks, especially here. And I agreed like Fair. that, that was my issue was it like, uh, well, maybe the Memorial day thing, maybe it was less people than I thought that were misbehaving, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe, well, I, that's how I kept telling myself. Yeah. Just stay home. Just stay home. Just stay home. Finally, it was like, okay, well now freaking everybody's out there. Like I'm going to be one of the last ones out of the house. I'm good yeah. with that. Like that's fine by me, but I don't, I'm going to be the last one out of the house. Yeah. But I don't necessarily need to wait six months after everybody else is out. Like a, a couple of weeks is probably enough. And I reserve the right to change my mind. I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not, again, I'm not entrenched. I'm just aware, trying to be aware. So I, the, oh, the, the, the reason it gets hard for me to get to the factual examination of data is because of all of the knuckleheads to me, right? All the people who, you know, like if you say, Hey, we're going to test our acoustics, your premise is, is not honest, right? That thinking is probably the way that you conduct many things. Yeah. When it comes to my health, that's not cool. Right. right. And so, uh, you know, I, I just think it's that it's that that's part of the problem is like, you know, the, the, the self determining as, as a polite word, the self determining behavior, just nobody lives in a bubble, man. I mean, I just think that, yeah. uh, and especially now nobody lives in a bubble. Right. Right. Um, and so I don't know how to, how to make sense of data when I know that there's a bunch of erratic variables that are running around. I don't know totally. how that's factored in. And again, you know, Memorial day was just three weeks ago. Yes. We're going to know a lot more in two weeks from Memorial day. We've had these unprecedented marches and, and protests, yeah. right? That's a lot of people right on top of each other. And that was another week. And, and then we, yep. and then we have pictures from parts of the country where people are like, woohoo, you know, it's time. And you know, they're all on top of each other. And so, Oh, that's here. Like, I mean, like a, a, a good part of that, it's not only here, but there's quite a bit of that happening here in New Hampshire. People yep. are like, yeah, we're good. And, and so it, like, to me, that sounds crazy. I wouldn't be doing that right now, but I sure am interested in the data from y'all doing it. Mm. I mean, yeah, I, I don't, just don't know when those people say, well, that was fun. I got out of the pool and then I drove two states away and what the effect of that is. Because sure. we, you know. Yeah, well, so, again, anyway, I, I, let me let me just so, rephrase this. I um, I'm sure how I'm sharing this is part of the frustration that people are getting back to work and I'm not. And, of and I realize that that's my problem, right? I get it. I, I own it. And if I've offended anybody out there, apologies, you know, that is my problem. It It's my problem until someone else gets me or someone I care about sick though. And totally. then, then it's, you know, eh. then it's everybody's problem. So I, I want to run something by you. Cause I, I reached out to my friends at the stone church um, because they, a, they're very close right down the street. And they have set up the, they have two parking lots there and they've converted one of them into their outdoor dining Palooza. I mean, it's freaking great. They've got 20 tables, all socially distanced. That's a lot. Most yeah. for places that don't ever do outdoor dining. That's crazy. You know, most places are lucky if they can do like four to six. Right. So they got 20 tables. They have a stage. That also is way socially distanced. Like if you didn't want to even get near the building, you could show up, set up your stuff and play. I don't know where you'd pee, but you know, other than that, <laughs> like you'd be good to go. So, and I'm sure that could be worked out because you know, whatever. Uh, anyway, I reached out to them and said, Hey, you know, I would love to, uh, you know, what, what are you, what are you doing? And also monkey fist is one of the bands that, I'm in where I feel really comfortable with Johnny and Maddie and Jimmy too, but Jimmy isn't ready to do anything, which is why I feel comfortable with him, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't be ready even in the next couple of weeks. I don't think mm -hmm. so Johnny and Maddie, 
the three of us, you know, it, it, there's a litmus test I've learned about. I've, I talked about how I asked bands like, Hey, just no judgment. Um, let me know what you've been, let us, let's all tell each other what we've been doing so that we can all make the decision whether we're comfortable getting together with this group of people or not. Yeah. And whatever you choose and whatever you've been doing is fine. I realize we're all going to get, you know, different parts of this wrong. We're going to do it differently. It's like no judgment, but please be honest. There have been some bands and they will remain nameless as will the specific members where one member chooses not to participate and reply mm -hmm. to that conversation. And that is a great litmus test for which bands I do not want to get together with. So, mm. uh, yes. Um, and, and again, it's no judgment other than the judgment I need to make about whether I want to involve with that group or not. Whatever you're doing yeah. is, is you. Yeah. Um, so Johnny and Maddie, great. So I pitched this idea to the stone church. I mean, it's this outdoor thing, you know, acoustic monkey fist with people sitting there, you know, having some, some appetizers and some dinner and some drinks. It, monkey fist is perfect for that. I mean, it's just like that band is perfectly built, perfectly engineered for that. We'd take requests. We'd engage the crowd. Everybody would laugh and have a good time and smiles on their faces for a couple hours. And that would be great. You know, it'd be good for all of us, us on stage, people out there. So I, I, you know, texted my friend, Mike, who owns stone church now and, and said, Hey, you know, what are you guys doing? And he's like, yeah, I agree. You know, that's the, the right vibe for us. Let's, you know, let me, he had to go get his calendar. He said, but here's how we're doing these things. And I was very much reminded of when we talked to uh, Brad Maddox on the show where he said, guarantees are going out the window in the touring business. Nobody's getting a guarantee. Everybody's mm -hmm. sharing in the risk and the reward. And so he said, here's what we're doing. We're, we're making them ticketed events. We pick together what the cover charge is going to be. He, he floated 10 bucks a head. He mm -hmm. said, you know, we've got 20 tables. You know, you can do the math if they're all four tops and, you know, there's 800 bucks on the table, or whatever, yeah. uh, it, you know, which is for an acoustic trio is, is a good draw. And he, what he said, which initially gave me pause. And then I realized, you know, I'm not really doing this for the money and I might like a partner in this. So I'll take it. He said, we give 90% to the band. And at first I was like, it should be a hundred percent because you're selling beer and food and all that stuff. And then I thought, well, this is sort of the new abnormal. And if you're to even take, if you're taking any sliver of this, you're in on the marketing too. Like this is your thing. We're just coming and, you know, doing our thing with you. So I kind of liked that idea of the partnership. I don't know though, if that's me rationalizing Paul or if that's actually a, a good thing, the payday yeah. in the end, even if the place is half full is still plenty for that band in these here parts. So, uh, so I, you know, and we talked about it as a band and everybody in the band was okay. So I, you know, I asked them, you know, their, their opinions on it and they all felt like, yeah, let's do it. Sure. Fine. So Dave, so what do you think? I, I, that conversation, I've had that conversation internally with my wife a hundred times already. Right. Yeah. And, um, it is theoretically possible to create the best situation possible. Like you said, people still need to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Like you said, between the 20 tables, people need to walk to their table. Um, you know, so you're not perfectly socially distanced for the entire time. Well, you're they, certainly, they're not. The, the band is very different in the band this is. particular. Yeah, band. but that was yeah. what I'm saying. But th that's actually my point is um, you, by us playing music, we bring people together. Got it. Are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? Got it. Yeah. Well. And I, I mean that in, sincere, no. in a sincere way. I mean, there are parks that I've seen here. There's a famous park in San Francisco where they drew circles on this giant park and you yep. get your circle. Yeah, right. But again, you still right. have to walk to your circle, right? Sure. <laughs> Everything like that. You could put a stage, you know, and the same thing with these these drive-in movie yeah. turned into concerts. There are ways to get people that is as safe as possible. Uh, I'll go back to this example of this club that that uh, is checking its acoustics. Video from people doing this showed people inside checking out the band anyway, right? Oh, of course. Well, so there's... Okay, so you're right that it's much safer... To stay home, you know, I, in, in my other life is the host of Mac Geek Gab. Uh, we often talk about computer security, right? Where it's like, there is no binary, uh, choice, right? You, you, it's a continuum between ultimate security and ultimate convenience. 
And the, the analogy I often use for that when we're talking computer security is look, you don't want somebody to come into your house and steal your stuff right now. If you were to have all of your walls of your house brick with no doors or windows, that would keep people out. Like that would be great security. Now, certainly somebody could bash down a wall and get in, but that'd be really tough. You know, the moment you add a window, they're not going to bash down your brick wall. They're going to target that window because that is the, you know, a much softer point of entry than bashing down a brick wall. When you add a door, well, holy crap, like now you're literally inviting people in. Of course, having a house that's full brick walls is terribly. No way to live. You can't. And it's no way to live. You can't get out. Right. right? So I get you, it. you've got to pick your 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 doors and your windows and you put them in safely. And of course, you pick the neighborhood that you're going to live in. And and in and depending on where you're choosing to live. And where you're able to live. And again, I don't mean to be dismissive about anybody. I'm just being practical, you know, giving a for instance here, you know, you might decide, okay, well, I don't even need a lock on my door or I only lock the door during these scenarios or, you know, I lock my door 100 percent of the time. Like all of those <laughs> things are OK, you, you know, and, and you make that decision based on a set of of criteria. We don't have all the criteria to make all these decisions but the brick house is a great tune to play and that's about the end of it. You know, that's the only time brick house is a good thing. Now, I, I like brick houses, but I like them with windows and doors, the brick house in my example, not so much. So, um, you know, that's to me, that's where we are with this. And what we do know some things and we do know that a being outdoors, the transmissibility of, of this thing is greatly reduced as compared to indoors. We do know that being six feet apart from other humans greatly reduces the transmissibility of this. We do know that wearing a mask greatly reduces the transmissibility of this. And so, you know, we went out to eat the other night. It was my son's graduation. I was freaked out. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it was like, all right, we can do this. But I haven't even really been to the store. Like, my family's sort of been doing that shopping and, and all that stuff. So I, I, this is when I realized last week, I'm like, wait, I got to desensitize myself mm. to, the, to the paranoia here. And I need to make informed decisions, not just the comfortable one of I, I don't have to leave. So I, so, I get to, so I get to, you know, chill and, and not even think about it. So we did went out. We went out to eat all the tables that my friends own the restaurant. So. I, I, and I trust them. Great. Uh, all the tables were more than six feet apart. Great. You must wear a mask when you are not seated at your table. So coming in mm -hmm. and out of the restaurant, everybody's wearing a mask. All of the staff is wearing masks a hundred percent of the time. Y you know, they, they had great guidelines of look, when your wait staff is at your table, don't talk with them, let them drop your things off and back up. And now you may speak to them when they're far enough away and like, you know, all this stuff. And it was great. And that experience was actually really like it was it was uh, cathartic for me to, to go through it because I was paranoid. And once we sat down and I saw that, OK, you know what, all the data that even the limited data that I have, like all the things they're doing make sense. And actually, I feel comfortable here like this. This is OK now that I'm here, you know, getting in and out of the table. Mm, OK. But, you know, it was, it was weird because I just hadn't been that close to strangers in a while, but it was fine. And I and I feel like I know I don't have to feel I know that if those things are followed <clears throat> at a club, again, it's also outdoors, et cetera, et cetera. The risks are ridiculously low of of transmitting anything. So, you know, that's where I feel like, no, I'm not really part of a problem by mm. playing at the stone church, you know, I, I, but I, your question is the right one to ask. Like you got to ask if, if a club said, look, you know, we, we squeeze the tables together. Maybe we're at four feet and we don't wear masks, but look, you guys are totally safe on the stage. <laughs> like if they said that to me, that would be like, yeah, okay. Now I'm, now I'm part of the problem. You know, I'm complicit in this, but, yeah. but it is a good question to ask in, in this particular scenario. No, I don't think so. I don't think, but I could be wrong. You know, that's the reality of all this. I just, my gut in, in assessing the situation. So you're diving into the data and I'm kind of, you know, like one of the different ways our brains work. But well, you can't Again, trust I'm, your gut in this. I mean, well, it's, it, not it, gut. it's not gut. It's, it's what I'm saying is what is uh, a more common sense to me. So I'm saying 120,000 dead in 120 days. 
We've never seen anything like this in the past. We've been, we've been pushed to say the economy needs to be considered in this. I mean, really? I don't know. I mean, it just, it, it, so my common sense says we don't know. And then they're also dangling second waves out there. Oh, totally. I also know, I also know that a lot of people are not wearing masks and, you know, haven't and won't wear masks yep. and, are, you know, aren't being cool about, about the problem. They're more, you know, they don't care about getting someone else sick or if someone else gets, sick. I mean, I'm not going to say they don't care, right. but whatever their logic and, and self justification is, is that uh, the things that the CDC and the world health organization is saying don't apply to them. Right. <laughs> and uh, come, come test our acoustics, man. And so yeah, I just yeah, think, yeah. no, I, so, I so, so, like you have and to, those people are part of the equation to me. Absolutely. No, you have to evaluate or I am choosing to evaluate each scenario separately. So it's not like, I will take any gig. It's tell me what, I get you know, it. are you interested in playing a gig? Yes. Now I have some questions, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, and moving down that path, um, I, I, for me feels like the healthiest thing. And I mean that in a holistic way, uh, physical health, emotional health, you know, the, all of it. And, and my family's health too, because I, you know, and my bandmates family's health. Cause I realize you want to bring some home and you want to bring something to their correct. Homes. As much as we will maintain our distance on stage, we kind of have to go into it, assuming that we are intersecting our social. Bodies. Someone's got to help lift the, the main speakers. right? Well, it, we, with monkey fist. And that's another reason why monkey fist is a good band. We could vary. we Johnny and I had a long conversation about, okay, well, what would set up and tear down look like? And it didn't take us five minutes actually to figure out that, you know, we could each bring, like I'll bring the monitors. Johnny brings the mains. He sets his stuff up. I set my stuff up. The one intersect point was there's one PA and mics are not wireless, you know, mm -hmm. although I guess they could be like that. You, you know, you could go wireless mics, but without wireless mics, you know, you are plugging a cable into someone's vocal mic and into the PA. So the question yeah. was, what's safer? Should we have each person go to the PA and plug the mic in and then walk away? Or mm -hmm. should we hand, should we put the mic cable on the ground? And then, yeah. you know, if Dave's the one managing the PA, does Dave pick it up, plug it in and then sanitize his hands? Like, you know, but, but like that was the one touch point other than the fact that we're standing for hours on a stage with each other and we're singing, which, you know, most of the studies I've seen say that goes 30 feet. You know, and so now we're not singing at each other, but we are singing to crowds. So, yeah. uh, you know, that are eating and drinking and doing all those things. So, you know, the, there's and we've talked about some of the solutions for that in a previous episode. So, yeah, but that but like to me, those are the conversations that are very meaningful and helpful to have because we're not in a scenario where we're just choosing nothing. Um and I, and cause I think, what do, you mean, what do you mean by choosing nothing? Well, by, I mean, you know, choosing the status quo, which is, we just, we just wait, you know, mm. we do, we do nothing. We, we, you know, we let, we, we don't try to figure out the solutions based on the data. We just choose for me, it was choosing fear, you know, and I, I have a thing I, I do not, I have found throughout my life that anytime I make a decision based solely on fear, it is almost always a bad decision. Now there are some decisions based on fear that are good for us. Like it is meant to protect us. There are some things related to this where those yeah. are the right thing, but it, but not all of them. And, and that's where I kind of got myself into a trap. It was like, uh, wait, See, my Uber perspective is watching, you know what? There's 18 States that the cases are on the rise. They're not rolling back. Thing. I think Oregon right. is the only state I've heard of that is rolling that back, back and slowing. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, well, yeah, we'll see if more states begin to roll back. I mean, it. I can only I care about all of them. I care about everybody out there. I can only worry about what they're doing in my sure. state. Right. I you, get it. You know what I mean? It's like so. And hopefully my state, you know, we're we've been fairly lucky here um, and fairly contained and controlled. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, if we do see a spike we don't just dismiss it as a fluke and, you know, and make no change. But I also totally get that. I mean, you've, you've led a, a, a staff of people, you've led a, a you know, a team and a company mm -hmm. like any sort of, and you lead a band, you know, 
any sort of decision you are faced with as a leader is you have to, you have to weigh all of your options because you're, it's impossible to make everybody happy. It's impossible to do the exact right thing for each person. And so, right. So you need to kind of stop and look and evaluate and then, and then make a decision. So you don't want to make rash decisions. You, you know, you want to measure twice and cut once. Stakes are pretty high here. And the stakes are really high. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yep. So, you know, I, I appreciate, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't possibly agree with anything, everything any one person ever did. I certainly don't agree with every single thing our governor here in, in New Hampshire ever does. But this one, you know, like, and it's not just him, it's his office and his team and all of that. Yeah. But the way that they've been proceeding with this, it, it seems very logical to me. Now, yes, do I, I get it? Do I think overnight, do, do I think overnight camp should be open on, on June 29th? I don't know about that, but again, the data kind of supports it. Um, will I be happy if the overnight camp where my son works this summer chooses to remain virtual for the remainder of the summer? Yes, yes. Um, for sure. But we've talked about that too. And you know, it was like, well, what would you do? And he said, well, for me, this decision is pretty much easier. He said, because once I go to camp, I'm not coming back home at least for a while. He said, so it's, I don't have to worry about the three of you. I only have to worry about the one of me. And then all yeah. the, all the campers who are also all choosing to go, right? Opting in, sure. it, it's an opt in and, and everybody has to have at least two negative tests before they arrive. And I mean, they've, you know, they've like this, that's mandated by the state, by the way, they've yeah. got like all kinds of these things. Cause I, when the state released the rules with my son in the position he's in, I read all 12 pages immediately, you know. I do not doubt that like the stone church and your governor and my governor for that matter, that people are doing the best they can to make informed decisions. Right. I do think that there is an emphasis on economy. Oh yeah. It seems to weigh strangely because if all your customers are dead, you don't have, right. you don't have an economy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and you know, you can go out to this weirdness around our, our stimulus packages and the decision-making around that. And, you know, and the politics around that, you know, could they have said, listen, we'll shut it down. Nobody has to pay a mortgage. Nobody has to pay rent. Um, you know, we'll, we'll freeze that stuff until we really, you know, what have the countries that have been most successful in arresting this? What decisions have they made? Yeah. Right? Let's learn from New Zealand, right? Because they're done with it. I mean, they're also an island. So, you know, they do have they do have that going for them. Uh, But yeah. So, yeah, I don't know, man. Again, I get it's hard. All right. So I I got to ask you, though, because we got derailed from the question that I thought I was asking you. You answered a different one and posed actually some different thought process for me. So I'm appreciative of it. But my question was this pay structure that they offered us at the Stone Church. Do you, do you think I'm making the wrong, uh, all else being either equal or, or, you know, carved out of this particular question? If the gig makes sense, what do you think about that pay structure? It's been a long Tell time. Tell me again. So Tell me what it is again. It, it, they're uh, charging at the door, 10 yeah. bucks a head. Although if we wanted yeah. to change that in either direction, we could do that, you know, in, in partnership with them, 10 bucks a head. There's, you know, 20 table, 24 tops there. So 80 people. Uh, maximum, obviously, and they want to split it with us ninety percent to the band. They they're going to yeah. take ten. I think that's it, it, under any case that would be reasonable. I, yeah, and I mean, I happen to have gotten one gig where you know we've locked in a hundred percent of the door. Sure, um, uh, but that's unusual. And um, yeah, I mean, again, yeah, no, I I I in the insurance there. And again, well, if you were drawing sell- everybody, if, they, if people are only coming to see you, if like you were selling the tickets, yeah. then you deserve all the money. Correct. But it's their regular customers and totally you know, that type of thing. Yeah. So I think that's definitely yeah. They get. I mean, they get to sell them food and beer. You know, we yeah. are, as always, the people that keep them there drinking. Like, uh, you know, I, I know my place in, in this scenario and I'm OK with it. Uh, but but yeah, yeah. When when they said 90 at first, it was like it should be 100, man. And, and I didn't say that to him, but that was what the thought that went through my head. And it was like, no, I like having a partner in this. You know, yeah. yeah. And, and I can, I can push on that. Again, if, if you were a headliner and you totally. were selling the tickets, you know, no. then, then that's a different deal, but you know, they, they built the stage and yeah, they pay the insurance and, and quite frankly, they could, they could have said to us, we'll pay you 
you know, it, normally a gig like that for a monkey fist type band would be somewhere between three and 400 bucks. You know, they yeah. could, they could have said in pandemic sure. time, we're going to pay you 200. Would you take it? And the three of us probably would have talked to each other and said, yeah, sure. From That's- a pure business perspective, it's, it's a question of leverage. Like if you say no, yeah. thank you to the money, you know, you're not doing this really for the money. You're, no, you're doing but it. I don't want to screw other musicians. Right. Very I don't want to, I don't want I don't want to lower the bar to the point where now I've lowered the bar for everybody else. Ah. So let me let me circle around to to the um, to the club. The club has dangled that only those musicians who are coming in and doing these uh, acoustic checks will be considered for paid gigs when that comes around again. Oh, not that, we're, so we're not talking about the Stone Church here. We are talking about the club on the other side of the country that you talked. Yes, about. just for everybody. So I'm saying, I, yeah. Oh, that that's is no bueno. Of the thing. Exactly. Okay. So this is this is the thinking that's going on oh, in this, this environment. You you buried the lead on that one, man. <laughs> oh, oh, that's all you had to say out front. Oh, forget that, man. No. no. Oh, that's so, crazy. No, no, no. Treat no, the no. bands one way. Treat your customers one way. The yeah. disregard, you know, is is just. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's an easy no. <laughs> yeah. Easy no. That's an easy no. Um, yeah. Hey, before we um, close it today, I, I, you know, if I ticked anybody off out there, I'm was somewhat processing my own thoughts about this type of stuff. Yeah, and this was therapy today for both of us. It, it was, and, and again, you know, if you're someone who's like, heck no, you know, there's not enough cases, or even if there are cases, people can decide if they want to come out and see me, and you know, I get it. You know, we're all kind of getting to that. We got to figure it out. We're all going to make We got to figure it out. Yeah. You know, I wish you, even if you're making a decision that I wouldn't make, I wish everybody out there health and safety. I just, you know, I, 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 this thing feels very real to me. It feels ongoing to me. And so, you know, I hope you can understand where I'm coming from that. uh, uh, I, I, I part shed a tear for the hard work I put into my band for the years, but I also, you know, my gut, and my intuition and my ability to assess by a common sense what looks like is going on out there feels to me like there's a lot of that the, the data is hard to assess. You can't just assess it in a in a in a vacuum by itself. That's my opinion. I respect your ability and your your desire and your and your um, wherewithal to come to your own conclusions on this. So again, uh, uh, please accept my apology if I've ticked anybody off out there. I feel strongly about this, but I get it. It's there's a lot of individual decisions going on. Yeah. I just uh, it's our first pandemic, the, man. It's our first like we pandemic. We we're all going to get it wrong. We and and you know we need to as you just did. I mean that's a perfect example of in my opinion, the compassion that we all need to afford That's our, my ourselves and one another, like, exactly, you know, and I've got some bandmates uh, that are absolutely on the, yeah, we're, like, dude, look at the state. Like, we're fine. Don't worry about it. I'm not worrying about it anymore. And it's fine. Like, I'm not planning on playing any gigs with those guys, you know, anytime in the near future, but I fully realize that they may not be wrong. You know, sure. like I can't know that I'm right. In fact, I know that I've been wrong several times through this. So that's all I know, you know, is, and, and we, that's all we all, that's all we get to know is where we, were we right or wrong in the past. And really there's no benefit in my opinion of, of getting entrenched in that it's okay. Well, I was right in the past. So the thought process that I used that, that turned, that led to that, I'm going to keep applying that because it, it, mm-hmm. it worked once, you know, or if it didn't work, let's figure out why. And let's, let's iterate, you know, that, but that's me. Like, I'm, um, you know, that's how you, that, that's the entrepreneur's gift and curse is constantly, you know, just try things and see what happens. And then, but and then as iterate. musicians be cool to people, right. Be you know, cool. that's, yeah, that is, that is our path in the world. So that's it. Anyway, thanks, thanks, thanks for listening therapy, to what, what might have been our longest episode. I, I'm not entirely sure, but it sure seems like it. So that's what we got. No matter what you do, when you're performing, what do we say? Always be performing. That's it. I knew there was something. Be healthy. Be cool. Be yeah. kind. Wash your hands. <laughs>